All right, welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research, papers, and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Well, this is episode 125. Let's start with the news. As some of you may know, Brother Joseph James is rocking and rolling trying to get his movie in additional theaters. And many brothers around the states are heading up an effort in their own areas. If your location isn't selected for a screening on his new film, The Freemason, then write him a note at thefreemasonmovieinformation at gmail.com, and he can start a Kickstarter-type page for it. He just launched one for Chicago. I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, I've seen the movie four times already, but uh, I want to see it on the big screen. If you haven't seen the trailer for the film, I suggest you check it out. It's the first movie with a Masonic theme that doesn't actually make us out to be the bad guys. It's great. Uh, check out Joseph James on Twitter at Joseph James News and also follow the Freemason movie on Twitter for updates. Some other things I wanted to mention is if you didn't hear, Brother Robert Patrick Lewis is back stateside and is pumping out episodes left and right. He's changed his format just a bit and episodes are not as long, so if they were too long for you before, Check them out now. He has a great show, and you can follow him at Robert P. Lewis on Twitter, or check out his show Far From Centered on iTunes and follow the show on Twitter at FFC or Far From Centered. As a Masonic scholar and writer, I find writing rewarding, but sometimes I am in the mood to write about stuff that isn't Masonic, like history or rant about some stuff. Well, I was asked by Brian Dolch, founder of Iron Mike Magazine, to be a regular contributor, and I accepted. The magazine is focused on reforging the American man, and I have to say, it's a great site, and I am thrilled to be a part of it. Very honored, actually. Uh, Their team of writers, a lot of them are military guys. I come from a military family, but I wasn't able to serve. However, I hope I can bring a little bit of what I do to enhance the magazine a little bit, perhaps. Um, Like I said, I'm surrounded by good writers there already. What's this magazine about? Well, it's about America. It's about being a man, being a dad, being just... It's about veterans, fishing, shooting, the art of sport, all these things that make men who we are. But also it's about bringing back what some of us feel has been lost. So if that sounds cool to you, then check out ironmikemag.com. And I think you will really enjoy it. If you come across my articles, I'm sure you will know, even though I am not writing anything Masonic over there, I usually can't resist putting a little something of a Masonic reference in the writing. I wanted to thank Brother Rob Walk for his contribution to the show through PayPal. It really helps, Brother, so thank you so much. Also, Brother Walk has his blog up, and he moved it over to WordPress. He used to be on Tumblr, but now he's on WordPress. Head on over to WordPress, if you haven't yet, and hop on your RSS readers or Newsify or whatever you're using to read your blogs these days, and subscribe to on freemasonryandhumblepie.wordpress.com. I'd like to thank everybody who has been making the show and the Midnight Freemasons part of your Masonic routine. Without those likes and readers on the social media sharing, we just couldn't do it without you. So thanks again, and remember the Midnight Freemason posts three new articles each week, and we have a regular contributors, but we also have guest contributors from time to time. And if you're ever interested in becoming one, shoot me an email over at uh, wcypodcast.com at gmail.com. You can follow the Midnight Freemasons on Twitter at Midnight Masons. It looks like I will be making some lecture trips this year out to Pennsylvania, Southern Illinois, Chicago, and possibly Tennessee, maybe even Oklahoma and Utah. The last two are unconfirmed. Um, I'll keep you guys uh, all abreast of the news on that as that develops. So it's the new year, and let's get to work. Uh, The first piece I have for you all is something that I wanted to bring you a while ago, but it was getting run in a few publications, and I didn't want to compete with anybody who was printing it. So here it is now, The Holy Grail by Robert V. Callion, Past Master, E.L. Freeman Lodge Number 41, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. The Holy Grail. There are many versions of the origin of the Holy Grail, and legends even have it that the Grail still exists. William H. Jordan wrote, quote, In traveling among the common people of Old England and Central Europe, one may still hear the story repeated by 
mothers to their children at the close of the day, parents, teachers, and clergy even vying with one another and telling them how the cup fashioned out of the purest emerald from which the Savior drank the wine of the Last Supper was brought to him by angels from heaven, and that after the supper he gave it as a token of affection to Joseph of Arimathea, that same Joseph in whose new rock-hewn tomb his body was laid when taken from the cross that Joseph carried it concealed in the loose folds of his garment as he followed the Nazarene up the sides of Golgotha to, to the place of the crucifixion, and there caught in the last drops of blood that fell from his master's side, by which circumstance it became endowed with miraculous power to preserve chastity, prolong life, and heal the sick." End quote. Then, after the death of Joseph, the cup was taken in charge by the knights of the temple, by whom it was said to have been protected with zealous care for many years. Finally, it was believed to have been removed and placed in the window of a strong castle built upon a crag of the mountains of Asia Minor, where it could be seen from afar like a blazing star up in the universe, where no one could touch it save those whose hearts were bold, whose hands were clean, and whose lives were chaste. Then again it was removed by the angels from heaven, and placed in some remote place where it was concealed from all men, and should it ever be recovered, it would be by one whose hands were clean from sin. The Holy Grail came into literature quite suddenly during the 12th century, just about the time the Pope proclaimed the dogma of transubstantination. It is the general view of scholars that the Grail was meant to be sacred. Individuals have carried on the search for the Grail, chalice or lost words since the 12th century. It is here where the real mystery begins. What exactly were they searching for? A sacred chalice, the lost word, or possibly something more conceptual such as a hidden principle in some form of allegorical style? For over 800 years, man has futilely searched for something that turns out to be far more ambiguous and than essence intangible. He is looking for the underlying meaning of a poem written in the 12th century, one that appeared to be written merely as a form of entertainment for the royal court, yet evolved into an exalted piece of literature. We as a civilization have taken enormous steps to rapidly progress, and as a whole, have advanced in secular nature, but in spite of our advancement still retain one fatal flaw. We are far too susceptible to being deceived. Despite being the most numerically educated populace, the American psyche are notorious for turning fiction into fact, and to serve as proof, we only need to consider the best-selling novel, The Da Vinci Code, written by the author Dan Brown, in which he suggests Freemasons descended from the Knight Templar. Now heralded as the best-selling English-language novel of the 21st century, the author does make clear that it is partly a work of fiction. For further example, we can observe Disney's production feature film National Treasure, released in November of 2004. The story's impact has left the lasting impression that our founding fathers were infamous for burying secret treasures. Separating historical facts from legendary fiction has caused problems when chronicling history through the ages, and some may conclude the same of our own Masonic past. The story of the Holy Grail, the Sacred Chalice, the Alabaster Jar, and the Grand Champion of All, the Lost Word, and including film versions of Godspell, Jesus Christ Superstar, and The Last Temptation of Christ, have all contributed to perfecting a myth designed as truth. They all include tenets of heresy widely believed in the Middle Ages. At this point, let us attempt to historically re-enter the 8th and 9th centuries. Through historical documentation, we can view action of the royal courts. In addition to various forms of entertainment, the royalty would commission individuals to write poems of interest both for entertainment and possibly intellectual digestion. In the closing years of the 12th century, a man of great repute was commissioned to write a poem for the royal court. His name was Cretion de Troy. Cretion claimed the poem he wrote was based on the best story that had ever been told in court and that the story came from a book he received from Count Philip of Flanders. Count Philip asked Cretion to write a new version of the story, and the result was 9,000 lines of poetry including the adventure of a knight named Percival and his adventures with the Holy Grail. Philip's request was not unusual for this period in history, as patrons of the arts commonly had books written to order. How, where, and from what basis the poem originated beyond a retelling of previously written literature, research tells us much of its contents are from old Celtic myths, for the similarities are unmistakable. However, the very nature of the grail suggests it contains more 
then meets the surface, with text that reads like modern Masonic ritual loaded with symbolism. The story of the Holy Grail itself clearly reflects pivotal events unfolding at the time and the culture of the period in which its author lived. Being born during the early years of the Crusades and growing up with tales of the Knights Templar, then a powerful force throughout Europe setting out on a quest for sacred relics in the Holy Land proved a great influence. Christian de Troyes died circa 1185, was probably the greatest medieval writer of Arthurian romances. Of his life we know neither the beginning nor the end, but we know that between 1160 and 1172 he lived, perhaps as a herald at arms, according to Gadsden Paris, based on Lancelot. At Troyes, where was the count of his patroness, the Countess Marie de Champagne? She was the daughter of Louis VII and of Eleanor of Aquitaine. It appears from contemporary testimony that the authority of this celebrated feudal dame was weighty and widely felt. The old city of Troy must be set down large in any map of literary history, for it was there that Creation was inspired to write four romances which together form the most complete expression we possess from a single author of the ideals of French chivalry. These romances, written in eight-syllable rhyming couplets, treat respectively of Freck and Aeneid, Cleegs, Yvain, and Lancelot. Another poem, Le Roman de Perceval, oui le Cante du Graal, was composed about 1175 for Philip, Count of Flanders, to whom Creation was attached during his last years. It was left unfinished at his death. It is commonly accepted that Creation based his story on Celtic sources, one such candidate being the story of Paredu, a version of which would be incorporated into the collection of Welsh legends known as the Mabinogian. This would explain Creation's Percival the Welshman. The tales known as Matter of Britain might have arrived in Brittany with refugees from the Anglo-Saxon conquest of England. This migration during the 5th century, beginning perhaps as early as 380, is mentioned by writers such as Nennius circa 800. Procopius, the Byzantine chronicler, recorded that both Britons and other peoples in need of land for expanding population migrated from England to western Gaul and to northwestern Spain, where they were allowed to settle on depopulated land. Continued contract with kin in England can be assumed, and so it is likely that songs and stories circulated on both sides of the channel. The surviving but Fragmentary Welsh literature suggests a rich tradition from which Cretan and other writers shaped the matter of Britain. The Holy Grail is one of the greatest literary works of all time. The story is both that of Percival's coming of age and his quest. The first part shows how this teenager, after being raised in a forest by his mother, discovers the ways of the world. He discovers knights and kings, tastes the pleasures of love and pain of combat. Naive at first, he slowly adapts to this world, yet never really fits in. After he sees the grail in a castle that he came upon by chance, he then starts learning more about who he is and what the significance of this event might have been. He goes in search of the grail, yet the text being unfinished, the reader can only speculate on the result of the quest. Christian de Troyes was the most important French writer of his century. By the time he wrote the grail, he was already famous, for he had already composed four Arthurian romances, as well as other romances and songs. The wisdom of man is often expressed in stories or myths. Somehow, when we feel the truth and moving human narrative, we accept the truth more easily and can resolve to follow its light more firmly. Such is the case with the legend of the Holy Grail. This story, whether fact or fancy, truth or fiction, has a philosophical meaning for all Scottish Rite Masons. In fact, the story of the Holy Grail has appealed to the poet and storyteller through the ages. Nearly 500 years ago, Sir Thomas Mallory wrote his stories of King Arthur's court. 400 years later, the English poet Tennyson made the stories live again in beautiful verse in his Idols of the King. And in America, poet James Russell Lowell made us this legendary material in the story of the dream which came to Sir Launfall during his search for the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail, or Quet du Saint Graal, was the cup which the master of Galilee used at the Last Supper with his disciples. This cup or chalice of the Last Supper is said also to be the one in which the blood which flowed from the wounds of the crucified master was miraculously preserved. From the romantic writing of Cretan de Troy, many stories have been written, but none more important to Masons, due to the implication within the Holy Grail which contains the mystery of the Lost Word. The idea of the Lost Word is much used in our Master Mason's degree, and the Rose Croy degrees of the Scottish Rite offers a very fascinating psychological touch. The Lost Word is 
a lost treasure exactly as the Holy Grail is, and it is in the seeking of it that one grows, learns, experiences, and eventually discovers. The theme is discovering the divine. It has the idea of a treasure hunt for adults, and that is not to be taken up lightly because it is very real treasure the lost word represents. The entire point of the lost word is that each of us must make, quote, every effort must be made to recover it, end quote. The word has power. The word is the holy grail of Freemasonry exactly as its recovery is the significance of the search for the holy grail is. This is how many ancient societies viewed this fascinating theme. What we do learn is the understanding of the ancients with the power of the word certainly a theme Freemasonry also has, uses, and enjoys. It is a most singular fact that even the grail was thought to be a book, among other things, an accumulation of powerful words. Religious historians explain that the creation of the lost word was caused by God saying, let there be light, and there was light, the significance of which is the writer of the Gospel of John, one of Freemasonry's St. John's, condenses both of the philosophies of the Egyptian sages and the writer of Genesis by elevating the word to a position where it has become not merely the most important function of the creator but a manifestation of him in conjunction with this theme the word that once existed having surpassing value was lost so a temporary substitute was adopted in its place but as the very philosophy of freemasonry teaches us that there can be no death without resurrection no decay without subsequent restoration on the same principle it follows that the loss of the word must suppose its eventual recovery Mackey goes on to say that, quote, the word therefore we conceive to be the symbol of divine truth and all its modifications, the loss, the substitution, and the recovery are but component parts for the mythical symbol which represents a search after truth, end quote. Again, expanding yet further, quote, the word with its accompanying myth of a loss of substitute and a recovery becomes a symbol of the personal progress of a candidate from his first initiation to the completion of his course when he receives a full development of the mysteries, end quote. Cretan de Troy created an epic poem that throughout centuries has proven itself as a literary masterpiece and has offered a foundation from which other exceptional English classics have evolved. He created a legend that has survived through the ages, and as long as man believes, it will live in perpetuity and inspire mankind to soar to greater heights of purity and righteousness. Quote, it will do Masons no harm to search through the tangles and the recesses of their hearts for the Holy Grail, to strive and live in such a want that sometimes in their lives they too may see the Holy Grail. End quote. Additionally, we must search for the lost word as it is here. Only from its great light will we find the secret life and discovered life must lead to truth in order to be fruitful. Quote, the final theme that the lost word found in our emblematic Freemasonry is the mystery of birth, life, death, and resurrection. End quote. What mote yet be? What may this mystery of Masonry be? Again, that was by Brother Robert V. Callian, past master of E.L. Freeman Lodge, number 41, Pawtucket, Rhode Island. And you guys know I always love Grail lore and anything involving the Grail Hollows or adventures of those sort always pique my interest. Next, I want to say if you have a minute, check out the website www.wcypodcast.com and click on the support the show button. We moved everything over there. When it loads up, you'll see all the ways to support the show. We have our apps, affiliates with Onnit Labs where you can get your alpha brain and tons of other great stuff for optimizing your mind and your body. You click through the links and you can even get 10% off by using the promo code WCY. There is a link there to go to Stitcher Smart Radio since we're on there as well. You can register for free and download the program for free use the promo code whence came you with no spaces and they send us a dollar to help out it doesn't cost you anything uh there's also a paypal donation button if nothing else strikes your fancy all the money raised in all of these links goes right back into the show also we have a new affiliate with brother Juan Sepulveda and freemasonryart.com unique masonic gifts unavailable anywhere else and that's because Juan makes them uh from fine art to finely crafted masonic aprons this is where you want to go. Uh, you can use the promo code WCY for 10% off as well there. And you don't have to click through any special links or anything. You can just go to freemasonryart.com and use that promo code. And uh, 
Brother Juan has generously put together the affiliate program in order to help support our show. So anytime you buy anything from him and use our promo code, he gives us a couple dollars. So it's a win-win. Uh, next is this week's famous Freemason, Ralph Wilson, who is an American businessman and founder of the Buffalo Bills in the NFL. He was a member of Killwinning Lodge Number 297 in Detroit. Ralph C. Wilson Jr., born October 17, 1918, of course was the founder and owner of the NFL's Buffalo Bills. He was one of the founding owners of the American Football League as well, the league that the NFL merged with in 1970, and is the last of the original AFL owners. He is the oldest owner in the National Football League at age 95, and since the death of Bud Adams in 2013, is also the longest tenured 54 years. He was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame on August 8, 2009. Wilson donated about $2.5 million to the construction of a Pro Football Research and Preservation Center at the Hall of Fame. The facility was named in Wilson's honor on August 13, 2012. That's it for this week. Remember to find us on Facebook and follow on Twitter at Whence Came You. Please check out our podcast partners, Far From Centered, with Brother Rob Lewis as well as uh, The Winding Stairs with Brother Juan Sepulveda. You can find them on Twitter at Winding Stairs 33 and at Robert P. Lewis. Keep checking back three times a week on the Midnight Freemasons for awesome content every single week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Remember, if you're wanting better water, please check out Brother Jeff Koch's business, PB&J Water. Links are on the right-hand side of the page on wcypodcast.com. I also wanted to mention before I go that I signed up for a program that sends me guest requests. Brother Rob Lewis had some success with this, uh, but we will be getting more guests on this show as well now because of it. Uh, right now, there are several guests in the works, including Brother Bill Hosler. Uh, we're going to talk to him, hopefully, about the 50-year member series and where he kind of gets the inspiration for those. He is going to be compiling a book uh, for the 50-year member. Uh, we're all pretty excited about that. Uh, Brother Juan Sepulveda, of course, the producer of The Winding Stairs and the host, as well as the guy behind FreemasonryArt.com. Hopefully, we'll have him on to talk about his artwork and his podcast and find out a little bit more about Brother Juan Sepulveda. Uh, we're going to talk to Brother Anthony Mangelli as soon as we can get our schedules aligned we've had some issues with our schedules they completely conflict all the time but hopefully we're going to get it worked out brother rob lewis is going to come on and i think that episode's going to be a long one um we're probably going to just sit around and talk indiscriminately about all kinds of things of course centered around masonry we might go off on a tangent here or there it's going to happen uh, that's what happens when rob and i talk so uh it'll be a good one uh sean gorley author of freemasonry defined uh it's another great book We'll talk to him about that. And there's there's a bunch of others. Uh, I've even got a couple of guys who produce uh, some television shows, and they tried to come up with a Masonic television show to showcase masonry in the Old West. They created about an eight-minute promo video, which was on Vimeo. I have a link to that on wcypodcast.com. If you go to special guests, down at the bottom it says upcoming guests. You can click on their names, and it'll show you that video. It's pretty neat. Um, we're going to talk to those guys uh, one of them is a Freemason. The other is an expert on Freemasonry. I want to have those guys on together so that we can talk about what we can expect from them. Hopefully, we can get some generated interest in this project because they started this thing back in 2012 or 2011, maybe. So hopefully, we'll get to talk to them about their stuff. And again, tons more guests coming up on the show. So stay tuned. Also, if you are listening and you want to be a guest on the show, you can always email me at wcypodcastguest at gmail.com. It's a separate email that I have just for the guests to email me. If you've written a book, you want to talk about esoteric stuff, whatever it may be, shoot me an email. Also, I think toward the end of January, I'm going to be on Gnostic Warrior. It's another podcast. It's very cool. Brother Todd Creason had been on that show in the past. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about yet. He's going to send me some notes about the show, and we'll square that away. And I, like Again, I, I think we're going to do that show sometime in late January. I don't know if that it will be released right after the episode or a week later. I don't know what his process is, but uh, the host, Mo, is a pretty cool guy. I follow him on Facebook also. Always puts up some pretty interesting things. So, 
Gnostic Warrior at the end of the month. Also, I think I'm going to be on Juan Sepulveda's show at some point. We're kind of working out a thing where he's going to come on our show. I'm going to go on his show, do a little cross-pollination. Same with Rob Lewis. I've been on his show in the past, and I'm going to have him on our show. So, until next week, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson.